Hey, it's your boy CD from um, Tighten Up Today. I'm coming to you in a different circumstance than normal. I'm actually in a hotel hallway um, next to an elevator. I actually got a fire alarm behind me. Um, I'm on the road in France, um, but still got to bring you the news. So let's, let's get it going. Um, on this episode, I'll break down pros and cons of week six. Give you the recap. There's plenty to discuss um, to include our quarterback situation naturally. Um, but no, no need to delay. Let's get right down to it. All right, then. Let's get right into it. Let's start off short and sweet, nitty gritty. The Titans were shut out 16 to 0. The offense played extremely horrible, um, I would say in every facet, um, to include the running game, the passing game, the O-line, wide receiver play, um, play calling, head coach decision-making, all of that. Um, penalties, pre-snap and post-snap, um, and we scored zero points. So that's kind of what you get when it's all said and done. Um, the defense played lights out, period. They've done it again, except for, of course, Two plays, one was a 40-plus yard um, reception by um, Cortland, Sutton, sorry, um, Cortland Sutton on the left-hand side, and the other was um, uh, Philip Lindsay break tackle in the backfield, and he escaped for like 30-plus yards, whatever, on a run. Um, one sack, one interception, and only gave up 16 points. I will say that out of those 16 points, I believe two of those drives – total of 10 points that basically started on the other side of the 50 based off of turnovers in our situation. So basically already in field goal range. Um, special teams punter Brett Kern specifically was near perfect as usual. Okay, so um, the highlight and you know, why probably most of you on here listening to me still um, after especially a game like this to recap. Um, midway in the third quarter, um, head coach Mike Vrabel decided that it was time to um, bench Marcus Mariota, our starting quarterback for the last four years um, outside of injury, um, and put in Ryan Tannehill because he believed that he would give him the best opportunity to win. Um, he was very efficient with the ball. I think he only had three incompletions as he was 13 for 16, 150 yards, no touchdowns, and one interception. Um, although it seemed good on paper, I will say the, the back end of the fourth quarter, a lot of it was garbage time, yardage. It was very loose, and he was able to throw the ball. There were some good plays that he threw um, to wide open wide receivers, which was amazing because I haven't seen our guys get wide open like that all season. Um, but made some good throws um, and got sacked um, a total of four times um, in a quarter and a half, so on pace for – probably nine or 10 sacks on if he would have played his entire game. So nothing different than Marcus Mariota. I've watched the game now three times, um, like I always do. That way I try to eliminate the emotion of the first time whenever I wanna throw stuff all around my house. But um, watched it three times and I do believe that Marcus Mariota might have played his worst game of his career. And I would even venture to say I'm not um, an Oregon fan by any means. I didn't go through all his footage, but I would even say that he probably has never played this bad in all his games at Oregon as well. He was completely inaccurate, could not get the ball um, to a, on a screen pass, um, a five yard in, a five yard out, balls just flying all over and could not reach um, the target. It was, it was pretty bad. Um, I, it seemed like he was just off, to be honest with you, just off. Now I believe we can get into what the real issues are. The Titans' offensive issues start from the offensive line. The offensive line, period, bar none, is they might be the worst in the league. The way I'm, the way they've played over the past few weeks, it's bad. It's really bad. Um, offense can't score points, can't do anything, can't run, can't pass, can't do anything without the offensive line doing their job. That's blocking assignments. That's poor technique right now. Missed assignments. Just overall horrible. Pre snap, post snap penalties. Just bad. Um, next, after that, I would put another issue. I would, I would say wide receivers getting open. I just leave it as vague as that, getting open. I don't know if that's them not running their routes correctly, sharp, sweet, timing, 
making everything correct. But the way it looks like to me is that I wouldn't put it all on them. I honestly believe that um, at this point in time, Arthur Smith's last year's tight end coach has now reached his ceiling. Um, he's had some good games, um, play calling. I'll say, let's be more specific. He's had some good halves of play calling. If you look at it, the Cleveland first half of that was amazing. On the second half, it was run left, run right. It was nothing you know, exceptional. They didn't need to really do anything. The game was sealed up by halftime. The Atlanta game, similar. We put up 24 points and looked dominant um, throughout the first half. And then all of a sudden, we just sat on that lead and were unable to move the ball. It was like two different teams um, out there. But I do believe that he might have now got to a point where he's over his head and real defensive coordinators, like real good, solid, solid NFL defensive coordinators are now scouting and they know what we're going to do. It's not even um, any kind of creativity at all um, on his part. I believe that looking at this now. Cannot place all that blame on everyone else. Um, I do believe that Marcus Mariota's conservative play um, has also been an issue. Um, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with him playing conservative. Um, you can you can do all this conservative stuff and not throw interceptions, not turn the ball over. You can do that as long as you're completing all of those five to ten yard passes. Whenever those guys are in tight spots, he was accurate at Oregon. He was accurate the first few years in the league. He can put that ball where he needed to put it. He might be making some bad decisions from time to time, but whenever he does get a guy who's open, he can get it to him. Yesterday, he could not do that. Um, speaking of accuracy, I would say that interception, first off, don't forget over nine games, nine game stretch, he had not thrown an interception. And actually during the game, they spoke on it. He, for a few snaps, was the longest active quarterback with the most pass attempts without an interception because Mahomes had threw one earlier um, in the day. So he was being extremely cautious with the ball, not turning it over, doing what he's supposed to be doing. But then all of a sudden he throws two interceptions. Um, I really believe that it, to me it smells fishy, just a little off. And I'm thinking, why? Why would that out of nowhere? Nine games he hasn't done it. But I, I remember looking back, that Jacksonville game where he got sacked eight times. The very next game against Atlanta, he was throwing the ball away at any hint of pressure. And I'm like, I've watched him his whole dang career, and I'm thinking he's he's never done that. He'll find a way to try to break loose or make a play um, with his legs before he just throws a ball. He actually got a couple um, intentional grounding calls. One of them was picked up, but it's not him. Like, he would never do that. So it's almost like the coaching staff was pressuring, hey, stop taking sacks. You got to get the ball out. Um, if you don't get it out, you got to throw it away. That's cool. So he did that. That's the change. This next time, it's almost like they're, someone's telling him, whispering in his ear, you got to be more aggressive. You got to take more chances. You got to throw the ball in places that you've never really thrown the ball before and see what happens. Because that second, the first interception was kind of, uh, but that second interception where he comes up in the in the pocket, takes a few steps and just launches it out um, while he's about to basically get sacked. That's not something he has ever done. Um, he's not one of those quarterbacks that just, gunslinger and just throws the ball up for grabs. It's not his style, but I feel like like almost like he's getting pressured, um, applied on by the coaches, whatever, for him to press um, throwing the ball in places that he wouldn't normally play or press the ball. And I think we saw that um, against the Broncos. Something, something uh, I don't know. I, I just believe something is a little bit off, to say the least. Um, this actually leads me to another thing. So another belief, if you will. Um, and I, and I also say the, the final issue at this point in time, the hiring of Mike Vrabel. Now, just in a few episodes ago, whatever, I tell you, I love the guy. A Hall of Famer. He will be a Hall of Famer um, as a linebacker for the New England Patriots. Many Super Bowls. Great career as a player. As a defensive coordinator, great career with the um, Houston Texans, which drew enough attention for us to bring him over to interview him. There was another coach that we interviewed um, who also had a very stellar um, history before we interviewed him. His name was Matt LaFleur, our previous offensive coordinator. Now, where I get stumped, John, <laughs> I love John Robinson. I love him, man, so much as a GM. But I think that, you know, I'm not a professional general manager myself, but to me, it seems as if 
at that point in time, whenever we were looking at a new head coach and we were done with malarkey and we were moving forward, I think that was a good idea. But at that moment in time, we literally, our defense was good. Under Dick LeBeau, killing, great. Just, I'm not saying just as good, but they were solid, right? What our problem was is similar to now, it's our offense. We weren't consistent. We weren't doing our thing that we needed to be doing on offense. We needed a fresh offensive spark. That would have been the perfect moment. I think that at that time, instead of hiring Vrabel on as the head coach, we maybe hire on Matt LaFleur as the head coach, let him work with Matt, um, or Matt Ryan, let him work with Marcus Mariota the way he worked with Matt Ryan and won an MVP, the way he worked with Jared Goff in L.A. before um, he came over and Jared Goff went from horrible to great overnight. We had an opportunity to, to use that, his talent, or use his, his um, experience to push Mariota in the offense to another level. Um, we went the other route. We got a defensive court, a, um, a defensive coach, a defensive-minded coach to be our head coach, and then hoped that this um, offensive coordinator, Matt LaFleur, would stay um, and not go and take a head coaching job the very next year, which obviously we were completely wrong. Maybe Vrabel stays as a DC, um, and we continue to have Matt LaFleur. Maybe Vrabel leaves, and we have to hire someone else on um, to fill his role um, as a DC. I, I don't know. Obviously, you can't go back in time. You can't feel that. But I will say that there's been a couple of coaches that come to mind. John Gruden, Raiders head coach, could not. He had a great offense, but he just could not get over the hump because the defense was just not where it needed to be at. He goes to the Bucks, who have a stellar defense um, that Tony Dungy had manipulated and molded to get to that level. He takes them the first year and takes them to the Super Bowl, um, and they win the championship with his offense in mind. Shortly after that, the defense started to deteriorate because of the offensive mind, not able to take care of the defensive side of the ball. And he's focused on the offensive side. Tony Dungy would be another example with the Colts. Great defense of mind, goes over there and he has, oh, Peyton Manning, basically his own offensive coordinator um, in that offense. And then bam, out of nowhere, the defense starts to pick up to match the offense and championship happen. It's kind of funny how that works. You don't find teams that hire a new coach and then get a head coach that is going to continue to build on a on one of the teams that are already great like oh yeah we have a solid defense let's hire a, a, a defensive head coach no you hire an offensive head coach to pick up the slack to operate on that side so that we can be a, a, a solid balanced team all the way around and play team football um that's that's the first thing that comes to my mind i say even even sean McVay when he went to la last year in the super bowl but as soon as he got to L.A., the first thing that he, he talked about, he was like, hey, I know I'm an offensive guy. I'm not a defensive guy. The first thing he said was, I need to call Wade Phillips, one of the best defensive coordinators in our history in the, in the league. I'm going to call him and say, I need this guy as my defensive coordinator. And, and that was a smart play for us. What did we do when we hired on a defensive head coach? The first thing we did was we promoted our tight end coach to offensive coordinator. Zero years experience as, a, um, as an offensive coordinator calling plays, zero. And it's, it's just not even a smart idea. Like uh, at that moment in time, the only, thing that, the only thing that I was really truly worried about was that we would hire on another OC, that Marcus Mario would have to start all over again, learn different terminology, all this stuff, whatever, with him, and then would set him back another year or two or whatever as we tried to move forward. I was okay with um, Art Smith coming over and um, promoting him because it was the same scheme. He was gonna be doing the same play calls, and like so, everything would be about the same. The terminology would be the same. But what ended up happening is you have a guy who is not experienced enough, and you can tell that he's starting to reach his end. He's starting to he's starting to drown as an OC, and you can start to feel, and it's it's sad. And I I feel bad for him. I feel bad for a lot of people, but definitely it's sad. During the post game interview today. Um, I watched it live, Mike Vrabel, a reporter, and they've been tearing him up as I keep telling you guys, they've been ripping him up lately. A reporter asked a question that I've been asking myself for the past two weeks, and he finally said it. I'm going to play it for you right now so you can hear it. Um, you might have to turn the volume up a little bit because the, the interviewer, I'm sorry, the uh, reporter 
in the background. He doesn't have a microphone, so it doesn't sound as loud, but just take a peek and listen to this. Where you're at there. Right. Marcus has been to a Pro Bowl. He's been to the playoffs before you were hired. Since you've been hired, he's regressed to this point. Guess I'm just not a very good coach, Jared. That reporter, spot on and priceless. And if you didn't hear it, basically asked, he said, hey, Marcus Mariota was a pro bowler before you got here, had taken his team to the playoffs and won a playoff game before you got here, and now all of a sudden he's regressed. Why? And his answer was, of course, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I'm, I'm a bad coach, whatever. I don't know. And I'm not saying that he is. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that a question is a good, solid question um, to even consider. Bottom line, we got a problem, and it's a big problem. We need to figure it out now. We don't have weeks to figure it out. We need to figure it out now. This week against the Chargers, it needs to be ironed out. All these issues need to be ironed out. Or we're going headed straight for NFL purgatory. I'm talking 8-8, eight and 7-9, eight, and 6-10 and ten seasons. And we cannot do that for another 10 years. I can't, I can't watch the Vince Youngs, the Jake Lockers, the Zach Nettenbergers for 10 more years. We got a quarterback here. We need to press on. I'll conclude this episode by suggesting the Titans completely forget this game and act like it never happened. Mario had a bad game. It happens. We press forward. Ryan Tannehill is not the answer. We know that. You know that. We have to move forward with Mariota. I think that period dot... We're still going to start Mariota and move forward. I just don't know if he gets a big contract at the end of the season. That's something that we worry about later, not now. Um, again, I want to apologize for the situation in the hallway. Again, bad circumstances, but I still got you the video. I hope you liked it. If you did like it, again, click that button, like it, subscribe, uh, click the notifications bell, um, and we'll 